boys in the 1990s, when I was growing up, tended to immerse themselves in specific subjects, like miniature doctoral candidates. You had your dinosaur boys, your space boys, bug boys, truck boys, cowboy boys. I was an Egypt boy, through and through, obsessed with the pantheon of ancient Egyptian religion, the gods pictured in sidelong poses on papyri as they conducted mysterious rituals described in the margins in a bestiary language of vultures, lions, owls, and serpents. These dead figures took living form in my favorite childhood movie, Roland Emmerich's 1994 Stargate, which spawned a campy, low-budget television series. The original film, however, is a glittering sci-fi spectacle, or at least the parts featuring the sun god Ra. He's not really a god in this film. It's an ancient alien's explanation of history, in which Ra is an extraterrestrial posing as a deity. I doubt my five-year-old self understood this. Along with the ancient Egyptians in the film, I revered this Ra as a god incarnate in the captivatingly androgynous body of actor J. Davidson. He appears on screen for less than ten minutes, but he made a profound impression on me with his diabolical smirks, glowing eyes, and electronically filtered voice. I used to reenact scenes with my little brother, Luke. I bet you can guess who I played. Our favorite clip to perform was the scene in which Ra electrocutes one of his guards using a bejeweled bit of hand bling. I would dramatically hum Ra's slinking chromatic leitmotif by composer David Arnold. Da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. I would imitate the throaty consonants of the reconstructed ancient Egyptian language that Ra speaks in his growling robot voice, rebuking Luke before zapping his brains out. It's cute when kids play make-believe. At least, it's cute to grown-ups. It's charming to see how children throw themselves unabashedly into an imaginary scenario. Adults vicariously relive that spark of magic that came from believing in Santa. We associate the phrase make-believe with juvenility and pretense. Let's make believe we're unicorns. There's an assumption that children are simply play-acting, and that they know deep down that they're not really Elsa or Iron Man. But it's not so simple as all that. We tend to dismiss childhood as pure frivolity, forgetting that these earliest experiences, even in playtime, are formative moments in our development, and demand respect. I think that, to some extent, the child truly believes that he or she has taken on this new persona, hence the phrase, make believe. There's an almost religious or ritualistic transformation akin to the Eucharistic mystery in communion, a kind of transubstantiation by which my five-year-old self was no longer Joey, but transmuted into Ra. I suspect that make-believe is our earliest manifestation of a deeply ingrained impulse that doesn't disappear as we get older, but is sublimated into activities that adults can engage in. Sometimes we sense a certain regression or immaturity in the forms that this can take. One word, furries. And activities like cosplay, which take a great deal of creativity and imagination, can unfortunately be disparaged and mocked, though I think this may have much to do with the awkward public settings in which these masquerades are carried out. In modern Western society, there seem to be two respectable forms that this make-believe impulse can take for adults. The first is theater, either as an onstage participant or as an audience member. And the second is religion, especially rituals and mysteries. Childhood make-believe seems to split into these two components when one reaches adulthood. Theater takes on the dress-up, costumed, pretend side, but loses the believe part. 
Neither actors nor audience actually believe that Sarah Bernhardt has transformed into Hamlet, even though that might be a metaphor used to describe an actor who has thrown herself entirely into a role. Religion takes on the faith-based believe part of make-believe in rituals like communion, but loses the side consisting of acting out a scenario or donning costumes. While special garb might be worn by Judeo-Christian clergy, there's rarely any play-acting or situations in which congregation members dress up as different personalities. One exception in Christianity is the nativity pageant, which, tellingly, is allocated to children. But there's never any confusion that the brat who bullies your kids in Sunday school is the immaculately conceived Mary. This division of religion and theater seems to be a relatively recent development, at least in Western culture. Examples from Western history, like ancient Greek drama or medieval passion plays, show that this make-believe impulse was at one point unified in forms of faith-based theater. But ritual theatrical traditions exist still today in other cultures, involving both children and adults. Balinese Sanghyang dancers enter a state of trance-induced supernatural possession, taking on the characteristics and powers of the spirits that inhabit them, including the ability to walk through fire. Likewise, when members of the Arizona Hopi tribe don kachina masks, they acquire the abilities of these ancestral and nature spirits, performing song and dance rituals to ensure rain and a plentiful harvest. Finally, in the Ramlila plays of North India, the Hindu Ramayana epic is reenacted over several days, with the five main characters portrayed by boys. The moment they put on their costume crowns, these children are considered incarnate deities and are treated as such. Their feet are never allowed to touch the ground except when they perform, and they must be carried from location to location as the Ramlila is performed in several outdoor locales. Composer R. Murray Schaefer's 1983 Ra is part of a radical attempt to transform the genre of opera into a multi-sensory ritual theater along the lines of these global traditions. Ra belongs to Schaefer's cycle of site-specific theatrical works, titled Patria, which is Latin for homeland. Schaefer, who was born in Sarnia, Ontario in 1933, and died at the age of 88 in 2021, admitted that it was hard for him to muster feelings of patriotism for his native Canada. Many of the 12 entries in the Patria cycle explore different cultures, myths, religions, traditions, and languages, almost as if Schaefer were wandering through the past to find a new homeland that resonated with him. Aside from the ancient Egyptian setting of Ra, there are Patria entries set in ancient Minos and Tang Dynasty China. Or else, Schaefer attempted to reconnect with Canada through its natural environment, but always in a way that goes beyond simply performing out of doors. The plots and music of his Patria compositions often take into consideration the natural landscape of a locale. Not just the physical space, but also its soundscape, that's a concept that Schaefer helped to popularize. A soundscape is an acoustic environment encompassing the sounds of animals, plants, weather, etc., as well as the way in which sound carries in these outdoor spaces. This is the key to understanding many of the works in the Patria cycle, four of which take place in forests, two of which involve bodies of water, and one of which requires its participants to plant a garden in the spring and harvest its fruits and vegetables in the autumn. In a series of essays in his book Patria, the Complete Cycle, Schaefer lays out a theory of what he dubs the theater of confluence. Ideally, he writes, what I want is a kind of theater in which all the arts meet, court, and make love a theater in which all the arts are fused together, but without negating the strong and healthy character of each. 
So Richard Wagner may come to mind with his four-evening operatic cycle Der Ring des Nibelungen and his concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk. Wagner sought to reinvent opera in the spirit of ancient Greek drama. His stage works, which he redubbed music dramas, would unify multiple art forms into an immersive theatrical experience. Now, for Schaefer, Wagner had the right spirit, but Schaefer argues that his German predecessor remained first and foremost a composer, and that Wagner couldn't help privileging the score over the other multimedia components of text and staging. Schaefer, however, wanted a true merging of the arts and senses. I am calling this the theater of confluence, he writes, because confluence means a flowing together that is not forced, but is nevertheless inevitable, like the tributaries of a river at the precise moment of their joining. Schaefer wanted to move beyond the interaction of just the text, music, and production, the big three components of traditional opera that appeal only to the ear and to the eye. He wanted to bring the haptic, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory, or taste, experiences into the fold, to incorporate theatrical components that could appeal to these neglected senses. Life itself is the original multimedia experience, he writes. Granted, Schaefer warns that such synesthetic exercises, as he calls them, run the risk of sensorial overload. There must be a kind of rhythm or controlled counterpoint so as not to overwhelm the participants. As a useful model, he offers the Catholic Mass, seeing the architecture and stained glass, hearing the choir and sanctus bells, tasting the bread and wine, smelling the incense, and feeling the kneeler or the rosary beads. It's telling that Schaefer selects a religious ritual as his example. In one of his Theater of Confluence essays, Schaefer theorizes that art must be literally extraordinary, that its first purpose is to remove us from our everyday reality, to which we then return transformed and with a new perspective. Schaefer explicitly calls for a recovery of the sacred. When I speak of the divine, he writes, I am thinking of everything mysterious, everything beyond our ability to construe or temptation to dominate. Although he initially proposes the Catholic Mass as a model for multisensory art, he ultimately rejects Christianity as too humanistic, an anthropocentric faith with little regard for the natural world. In formulating his Patria works, the composer sought out religions and cultures that explicitly sanctify nature and that recognize our place in a larger whole. Man is also divine, he notes, not more divine, just divine along with the rest. Schaefer found such a tradition in the ancient Egyptian faith, which brings us finally to Ra. Unlike the Christian tale of resurrection, which focuses solely on Christ's death and resurrection and its consequences for man, the Egyptian resurrection story involves the natural world. The daily setting and rising of the sun were interpreted as a divine cycle carried out by the sun god Ra, who traverses the dangers of the underworld in his solar bark during the night, rising in the east at dawn, reborn rejuvenated, and renewed. We mere humans play a part in this process. We too will traverse the underworld upon our death, face judgment, and, if deemed worthy, be transformed into gods ourselves. Schaefer's Ra is an all-night work of ritual theater that begins at sundown and ends with the rising of the sun. Over the course of about 11 hours, the audience is led through a series of initiations, rituals, trials, and participatory actions based on descriptions of the afterlife in the Egyptian Book of the Dead and other sacred texts. Schaefer compiled the libretto himself, consulting with Egyptologist Donald Redford, 
The composer was incredibly thorough in his research. The texts are sung in ancient Egyptian, with the original hieroglyphs painstakingly transcribed next to the transliterations in the score. This deluxe score is a marvel to behold. Schaefer, who was a skilled draftsman, has filled its pages with reproductions of papyri and friezes, as well as his own comic book-like illustrations. Most of Ra is historically accurate and faithful to Egyptian traditions. While Schaefer takes some creative liberties, as we'll see, they're always in the spirit of the ancient Egyptian religion, and never for the sake of pure exoticization. The cast comprises a male chorus and approximately 25 solo singers, actors, and dancers who portray the pantheon of Egyptian gods. They're accompanied by a six-piece ensemble consisting of Middle Eastern instruments, along with violin, harp, percussion, and an electronic tape track. In keeping with the other Patria works, Ra is site-specific, spread over several indoor and outdoor locations though these are far less natural than the forests and lakes I mentioned as settings for several of the cycle's entries. The 1983 premiere was mounted at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto. Schaefer's design team had to cover up exhibits and display cases with painted hieroglyphic panels, creating a multi-chamber, temple-like space for the opera to unfold. In preparation for Ra, the creators spent two nights at the museum to test out how the order of scenes corresponded to what Schaefer calls the rhythms of boredom and arousal over a long period. This was less a consideration of the audience's comfort than a means of ensuring that the rituals would have the maximal emotional impact on participants. When rest was longed for, writes Schaefer, we would make people run. When they were thirsty, we would choke them with incense, not out of malice, but in order to break down their cognitive and critical faculties and allow faith in the miraculous to enter in. Now, audience, as Schaefer notes, is not the right word for the attendees. Instead, he refers to them as initiates. Indeed, they are ceremoniously sworn in at the work's outset and prepared for the strange and miraculous rites they will witness. The initiate's main guide is a priest with the title of Hierophant, meaning one who shows what is holy. It's the same Greek prefix hiero in hieroglyph, meaning sacred carving. For the first half of Ra, the Hierophant wears the jackal-headed mask of Anubis, god of death, tombs, and the underworld. In the second half, he exchanges it for the ibis-headed mask of Tot, god of the moon, knowledge, and writing. But Schaefer is careful to explain that this is no mere dress-up. He writes, In posture and movement too, the performers must believe themselves to be hypostasized divinities and servants of the gods. When the Hierophant puts on the mask of Anubis or Tot, he is Anubis or Tot. And Schaefer has italicized that crucial word, is. Assisting the Hierophant are three hierodules, a term invented by Schaefer. These assistants have the most on the ground interaction with the initiates over the course of the night. Shortly after sundown, the initiates are ferried into the halls of preparation where they are briefed by the Hierodules before their journey into the Underworld, or Duat. They're tutored in an hour of lessons in multi-sensory tricks and techniques to survive the dark descent ahead of them. It's worth considering this initiation in detail, as it stands out as the most unusual and unoperatic aspect of Ra. I will try to paint the scene here, Actually, not a scene in the theatrical sense, which is why Schaefer uses the term editing unit for the work's subdivisions. The 75 initiates are decked in white robes. They enter the dimly lit main hall, perfumed by rose and benzoin, an earthy-scented gum resin similar to frankincense or myrrh. From the corner of the hall, we hear the strains of a solo oud, 
a short-necked Middle Eastern lute. Without any notated sources that would offer insight into how ancient Egyptian music sounded, Schaefer found a stylistic surrogate in Middle Eastern classical and folk traditions still practiced today. He was assisted by the Egyptian-Canadian musician George Sawa, who, in addition to composing a few musical numbers for Ra, played the Kanun Zither in the premiere production. In the Arabic-influenced portions by Schaefer himself, the composer specifies the makam, or melodic mode, that the ensemble was playing in. The music for this initiation process, however, is entirely improvised. But to give you a sense of the instrument's timbre, here's an excerpt of the oud player Ibrahim Elaish, who's featured on Sawa's very informative CD set, Egyptian Music Appreciation and Practice for Belly Dancers. After the initiates have filed in to the sound of the oud, a high rajual instructs them to remain silent as he begins the official ritual preparations. The initiates rinse their hands in water scented with musk, and are then tutored in a breathing exercise, passed down from Tot himself. In a kind of communion, they are given tamarind to chew, which they are told are the tears of Ra. So this is an invention, no doubt, of Schaefer's, to incorporate a gastronomic component into the preparations, but it's at least rooted in the Egyptian myth that humans were created from Ra's literal sweat and tears. The initiates then lie back to receive a lesson in clairaudience, the auditory equivalent of clairvoyance. In the underworld, it can be too dark to see, so one must take advantage of other senses. Each god and goddess is associated with an instrument, and their instrumental signatures are played for the initiates so that they can auditorily recognize when they're in a particular deity's presence. After this, the initiates are divided into groups and rotated through three stations, each with its own hierarchical instructor. At the first station, each participant is secretly given one of the 75 names of Ra, hence the number of initiates. These names are taken from a New Kingdom funerary text known as the Litany of Ra, which appears on the walls of several tombs. One of the litany's central themes, which carries over into the rituals enacted in Schaefer's Ra, is the importance of a deity's name. In the introduction to his translation of the litany, Alexandra Piankov writes, The name is not a mere appellation. It is part of the personality, even more, the personality itself. These names of Ra bear power and will be used like passwords by the initiates in the underworld, granting them access to deeper and deeper chambers. Initiates are forbidden to share their names with one another adding another layer of secrecy and mystery to the rituals. At the second of the three stations, the initiates are introduced to a series of perfumes that, like the instrumental signatures, are associated with individual gods and allow one to literally sniff out an invisible deity's presence. While incense did figure into ancient Egyptian worship, these specific associations in Ra, like the instrumental signatures, are largely an invention of Schaefer's. He assigns scents based on the attributes and personalities of the gods. Dark, chaotic, or evil gods, for instance, are given bestial, pungent, or spicy smells. 
One of the more pervasive scents is geranial, which is assigned to Ra himself. Geranial is not the same as geranium oil. Rather, geranial is the main component in citronella oil, which you likely know from the mosquito-repelling candles that contain it. It has a lemony, slightly putrid odor reminiscent of cleaning solution. It penetrates right into your nose, in a way that I can only describe as a beam of sunlight shooting through your nasal cavity. It's appropriate to Ra as a solar god, though I'm not sure I'd want to smell it over several hours, even if it ensured me protection against both evil spirits and West Nile virus. These scents are probably the most innovative feature of Ra. Schaefer has fully integrated them into the work, so that they function more than just superficial aromatherapy. Their systematic association with the gods grants them an almost musical character, like olfactory versions of the musical leitmotifs that Wagner attaches to the Norse gods in his ring cycle. They also deepen the sacredness of this ritual experience. Many of the scents, like frankincense and myrrh, were actually used in ancient Egyptian rites and in the embalming process. Like the first of these three stations, the third has to do with names. But rather than secret names to be whispered, these are the names of the serpent Apophis, which are to be shouted at the demon later that night, when Ra wages his nightly battle with his underworld nemesis. Again, this is the same basic idea as laid out in the Litany of Ra, that a name is equivalent to the essence of a god and can be used to channel his power, or in this case, subdue him. The initiate's name shouting is accompanied by an Arabic metric cycle called an ika, which is played here on tambourine and the darbuka goblet drum. Schaefer specifies a 12-beat ika called abul geit, which, because of its modern-day associations in Arabic culture, is the perfect rhythm for the initiate's combative chanting against the demon snake Apophis. In his manual on belly dancing music, George Sawa mentions that Ika Abul Gate is employed in the Middle Eastern Zar ritual, a form of musical exorcism still practiced in Egypt today. Here's a sample of Sawa's ensemble playing the rhythmic cycle Ika Abul Gate. During this third station, the initiates are also taught the three descending sacred tones, B-flat, A-flat, and F, which they can hum or sing as a form of musical protection whenever they feel distressed. The sacred tones are another invention of Schaefer's, but the idea is not too far removed from the hundreds of spells inscribed on Egyptian tomb walls and sarcophagi for the dead to recite as protective incantations in the afterlife. I was curious if audiences would find the sing-along too juvenile, but Schaefer relates that during the premiere production, groups of initiates would spontaneously intone these magic pitches as a source of comfort. After rotating through the three stations I've described, the 75 initiates are brought together again and taught a slightly more complicated melody. This is a song of rejoicing, the text of which, Sechme Ria Chante, translates to Powerful is Ra, Foremost in the Underworld.
The initiates are instructed to sing this whenever Ra is victorious over his enemies. And Schaefer adds that some simple choreography could also accompany it. Finally, the preparation process ends with a baptism in balm oil. The initiates are purified and ready to enter the underworld, though the Hierodules remind them that total submission is required and warn them that they'll be cast out if their sincerity falters. I had a sneaking suspicion that this line, and other similar admonitions in Ra, were to ensure against troublemakers and jokesters who might mock the proceedings. Indeed, Schaefer explains that at one point he even considered including bouncer gods in the cast. But as it turns out, the repeated warnings were enough. The few initiates who did have to be removed were, according to Schaefer, so invested in the proceedings that they felt overwhelmed and needed a moment to recover. Following the preparatory rituals and tutorials, the pages of Schaefer's elaborately illustrated score suddenly invert from black text on white to white on black, signaling that the initiates are entering the gates of the shadowy underworld. In traveling through the duat, which is laid out over a series of chambers and hallways, the initiates' personal journeys intersect with two others, stages of which they glimpse along the way. The first journey is, of course, that of Ra, who's portrayed by a silent actor pulled around on the god's solar bark. You've likely seen the deity depicted in his Ra Harakti form, with the cobra-encircled sun disk atop his falcon head. This is Ra in his powerful daytime incarnation. But at night, in the Duat, he takes his ram-headed Afu-Ra form, which is how he's portrayed for most of Schaefer's Ra. The second journey the initiates encounter is that of a nameless dead pharaoh, referred to simply as the king. He's portrayed by a countertenor, that is, a man who sings in his falsetto. This vocal gender bending lends a certain otherworldliness to a role, so the countertenor voice has often been used for supernatural or divine characters in opera. It's more than mere coincidence that Philip Glass, who composed his opera Akhenaten the same year as the premiere of Ra in 1983, also assigned his pharaoh Akhenaten to a countertenor. Now, it would be impossible for me to go over every single trial the initiates undergo and every ritual they witness in the underworld. It took me three days to read and play through the score, and to paraphrase the famous quote attributed to Marco Polo, I cannot tell half of what I saw, heard, tasted, felt, and smelt. But let me at least give you a sample of some of the more significant scenes, which, again, Schaefer refers to as editing units. I found it helpful to divide the editing units into three categories, depending on the level of audience involvement and the actions of the performers. So the first category consists of editing units centered on the participation of the initiates. In editing unit 18, for instance, Ra wages battle with the serpent Apophis, presumably represented by a puppet, though Schaefer doesn't specify in the score. This is when the initiates shout out the secret names of Apophis over Ika rhythms, as they were instructed earlier. Once the beast is slain, the initiates sing the Powerful is Ra chant that they were also taught. This is a key moment when the initiates are made to feel that they're involved directly in the action, and that their musical contributions have real consequences within the world of Ra. In celebration of the slaying of Apophis, the initiates, no doubt hungry as it's about midnight at this point, partake in a ritual feast of Middle Eastern cuisine during editing unit 19, complete with belly dancing and musicians. Editing unit 23 Schaefer titles Suspension, though nap time would do just as well. The initiates are given mats to rest on, while the disembodied voice of Tot gently whispers to them about the ancient Egyptian concept of Shen, a kind of yin and yang force holding all opposites in balance. 
I hope they got some energy, because here comes editing unit 26, titled Dark Messengers. It's a haunted house-like maze in which giant demon puppets attempt to snatch the initiates, who eventually find their way out of the dark using a rope. Schaefer notes in his book that, for the stink of miasma and putrefaction in this scene, he had a chemist manufacture a scent called Slum City. Editing Unit 28 is another obstacle course, in which the initiates pass through an aquatically decorated hallway, at the end of which is a tent-like structure through which they pass, one by one, a watery rebirth into new life. On the other side, they're greeted by the celestial cow goddess Mehet, who gives birth to Ra every day. She embraces each initiate, and they are washed and anointed with a trio of perfumes as the chorus sings a gentle lullaby. My second category consists of editing units that are closer to traditional opera. They feature one or two vocal soloists singing virtuosically, while the initiates observe more or less as audience members, that is, without participating. There are three of these second category numbers in total, two arias and a duet, all of which are assigned to female soloists representing goddesses, as male soloists dominate elsewhere in the opera. Two of these numbers are featured on a CD of excerpts from Schaefer's Patria cycle, and since those tracks are readily available online, I'd like to play an excerpt from an aria that only appears on the original LP of the 1983 cast, which hasn't been digitally re-released. This is the aria of Hazroet, a figure personifying the Egyptian necropolis in the city of Hemenu. After the Feast of Victory over Apophis, the initiates are invited into a courtyard, which Schaefer tells us is smoky and infernal, reeking of burnt clove. Accompanied by the male chorus, Hazroet enters for her aria, which ushers the countertenor king further on his underworld journey. Her text, taken from the Litany of Ra, is addressed toward the door guards of the Duat. Porters who guard the gates, she sings in Egyptian, direct his soul. This is another Middle Eastern-inspired number, which Schaefer has set in a maqam known as Nahawand Kabir. It's an extremely rich melodic mode that superficially corresponds to the Western harmonic minor scale, but with variable pitches that can be raised or lowered. In keeping with traditional Arabic musical practice, the singer playing Hazroet gradually feels out the pitches of this maqam in a free, unmetered passage that's close in style to what's called a layali. These are passages that are typically improvised by Middle Eastern singers, but since this aria is written for a mezzo-soprano trained in Western classical music, Schaefer specifies which pitches to sing here. Once she's traversed the whole scale, she proceeds with the metered portion of her aria, signaled by the entrance of a conga player tapping out Ika Darij. An Ika, remember, is an Arabic rhythmic cycle, and Schaefer has chosen a complex hemiola variation on Ika Darij that alternates between three groups of two sixteenth notes and two groups of three sixteenth notes. So let's listen to an excerpt from Hazrowet's aria. The goddess is sung by Schaefer's wife, Mezzo Eleanor James, who's accompanied by George Sawa on the Kanun Zither.
So far, we have the participatory first category of scenes, like the slaying of Apophis, and the more hands-off second category of virtuosic solo numbers that lean toward the operatic, like Hasroet's aria. My third category consists of ceremonial scenes that seem to lie between these two extremes. Ostensibly, the initiates simply observe during these ceremonial editing units, yet I would argue that, since the action is ritualized rather than quasi-operatic, there's a sense of spiritual participation for the initiates. These third category scenes are accurate recreations of funerary rites as described in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The initiates become like congregants here, bearing witness to something sacred that is more than a theatrical performance. The music, rather than virtuosic and operatic, as in the previous category, is liturgical, with chants and choral responses delivered in a prescriptive, religious manner. If the initiates contribute at all, it's only in humming the three sacred tones, in the way worshippers might respond with a brief Lord have mercy or Amen during certain portions of the Mass. Still, these minimal contributions give the initiates the impression that they're participating in a ritual that unfolds with their input. The most iconic of these rituals, which is recreated in Editing Unit 32 of Ra, is the double ma'at, the weighing of the departed's heart against the feather of truth, which you've probably seen depicted in many a Book of the Dead papyrus. In the case of Schaefer's Ra, it's the countertenor king who undergoes this judgment, overseen by an assembly of chanting gods, including Osiris himself. The king's heart is placed on one side of the scale, with the feather of Ma'at on the other. As the scales teeter back and forth, Schaefer heightens the suspense with up-and-down glissandos on the vibraphone and marimba that gradually narrow in range until the bar of the scale comes to equibalanced rest, signaling that the king's soul is worthy enough to pass into the realm of the gods. This leads to a thrilling ritual apotheosis in which Osiris, his wife Isis, and her sister Nephthys triumphantly proclaim that the king is a god completely, ushering in a celebratory chorus in honor of the newly deified pharaoh. The text here, again taken from the Litany of Ra, is reflective of another major theme in this funerary manual, that the king who undergoes the trials in the underworld is inseparable from Ra himself. For instance, one line in the litany reads, The victories of the king are the victories of Ra when he chastises Apophis. So this apotheosis scene in Schaefer's work is meant to drive home the fact that a mere mortal has become a god. It's the thrilling climax of the night, but not only for its dramatic impact, but also because of its implications for the initiates. Which brings us to a kind of fourth category of editing units, what we might call the imparting of mysteries. These are spoken moments when the hierophant, the head priest, remember, offers hermeneutic interpretations of the strange sights the initiates have witnessed, so that they don't simply remain exotic rituals, but are endowed with meaning for the participants. These explanations occur after the key editing units, those with the greatest emotional impact. For instance, following the king's deification, we have editing unit 36, titled The Ascent. Here, the hierophant is left alone with the initiates and removes his ibis-headed taut mask to deliver an exegesis on the holy mystery that's transpired. For it's not only pharaohs who have the privilege of ascending to godhood. The Hierophant's words are the key to understanding Schaeffer's theater of confluence, so it's worth quoting his speech at length. He says, Soon you will return to the brilliance of the newborn day. Return? No, for you have been changed by the secret gnosis of the litany. There is nothing that you will touch or think or say 
or hear that is not divine. And you must know this also. There are no gods in heaven if you are not yourself a god. That is the great mystery which our initiation has disclosed to you, your divinity. That is the great open secret, that all things which die will be reborn in the great cycle of Ra's journeying. I was initially frustrated with the participatory elements of Ra, which I saw as pure novelty, and occasionally juvenile, like when actors come into the audience to dance during the finale of a musical, or the way children at British pantomime shows are invited to yell phrases like, He's behind you! Ra, I felt, could have been a perfectly decent, and not to mention stageable, opera if it did away with the first category of editing units, the embarrassing participatory scenes. In his writings, Schaefer dismisses the bourgeois decadence of opera as both a genre and an institution to be dismantled. Yet there's a certain hypocrisy in the extreme expense posed by a work like Ra. Those essential oils aren't cheap. Tickets for the 1983 premiere cost a pharaoh's ransom of 150 bucks, the equivalent of nearly 400 Canadian dollars in 2022 though Schaefer did raffle off a subset of $2 tickets. The work's near impossibility is compounded by the physical, temporal, and emotional demands it places on both the performers and the initiates. I've always regarded opera companies as necessary evils. Of course, Schaefer's quixotic disintegration of the genre is appealing, yet opera houses exist. Opera orchestras exist, opera soloists exist, opera conductors exist, and so on. These artists and producers and managers and staff workers are already in place. There are no institutions to mount expensive, 11-hour sui generis pageants, for obvious reasons. Ra was performed in only two productions. Following the 1983 Toronto premiere, It toured to the Netherlands and was mounted as part of the 1985 Holland Festival. It hasn't been revived in the nearly 40 years since. And yet, there are frequent revivals of Egyptian-themed works that approximate the ritual participation of Ra. Mozart's Magic Flute premiered in 1791, eight years before the Rosetta Stone was discovered and original Egyptian texts could be translated. But it's miraculous how well the opera captures the spirit of ancient Egyptian mysteries, using knowledge passed down via the Greeks, medieval mystics, and Enlightenment-era brotherhoods like the Freemasons, the society to which Mozart and his librettist, Emanuel Schikaneder, both belonged. Granted, the magic flute is set in a fairy tale vision of Egypt, with invented mythological figures like the Queen of the Night and the Birdman Papageno. But all the ritual aspects of Ra are there. A chorus of priests led by a wise hierophant. Hymns to Isis and Osiris. Initiates who are indoctrinated into sacred mysteries and undergo trials. And the ultimate triumph of the rays of the sun over the forces of darkness. I found it more than a little suspicious that Schaefer never once mentions the magic flute in his book on the Patria cycle. With Verdi's 1871 Aida, Egyptian-themed opera unfortunately descended into Orientalism. There are some brief ritual scenes featuring hymns to the god Ptah, a name, by the way, from which the word Egypt is derived. But Verdi's opera exoticizes the ancient Egyptian religion, depicting it as something alien, pagan, and sinister. Neither we as the audience nor the characters on stage are tutored in the Egyptian mysteries, and the culture is reduced to mere stage dressing for the thoroughly Italian melodrama that unfolds in Aida. A century later, Philip Glass managed to de-exoticize ancient Egypt with his opera Akhenaten, which, again, premiered in 1984, but was composed in 1983, the same year as Ra. 
Like Schaefer's work, it's sung in ancient Egyptian, with certain sections in English, Hebrew, and Akkadian. In addition to elaborate ceremonies, notably the pharaoh's coronation, it also features a sun god. But this time it's the god Aten, the chief and sole deity of a monotheistic cult imposed on Egyptians by Akhenaten during the 14th century BC. The most moving moment of the opera is the pharaoh's Hymn to the Sun, a setting of a hieroglyphic inscription attributed to Akhenaten himself. He praises Aten's creation and expresses his personal relationship with the sun disk. You are in my heart, he sings. There is no other who knows you, only your son Akhenaten, whom you have taught your ways and your might. In this last example especially, it's clear to the audience that we've transcended opera. This isn't a love or revenge aria, but something resembling a liturgical action in a larger religious rite that we in the auditorium are seemingly a part of. Isn't that enough? Akhenaten has certainly moved present-day audiences, especially in its most recent revival production by Phelim McDermott, which had several international runs since it premiered in 2016. Schaefer's Ra, by contrast, hasn't seen the light of day in nearly four decades. While I appreciated the all-embracing scope of Ra on a conceptual level, I remained somewhat skeptical of its overly ambitious impracticalities. That is, until I experienced an epiphanic moment. In the fall of 2021, I saw the new movie adaptation of Frank Herbert's sci-fi epic Dune at a downtown Toronto cinema. While I enjoyed the design and direction of the film, I thought the performances were, frankly, god-awful, especially the dead-eyed, unemotional Timothée Chalamet as the hero Paul Atreides. After leaving the theater, I decided to walk around downtown in the light rain. Toronto looked like some cyberpunk Ridley Scott metropolis that evening, a neon cityscape shrouded in fog. In this vaguely futuristic setting, I was suddenly hit by a strange impression. I was Paul Atreides. Not that pouty, too-cool-for-school Timothée Chalamet. No, I was the Kwisatz Haderach the drinker of the water of life, the rider of giant sandworms, the leader of a galactic jihad, the god-emperor of Dune. Of course, reason soon set in, and the fantasy evaporated. But I recalled that I had had this exact same feeling as a kid in 1998, after seeing the animated biblical epic The Prince of Egypt. I distinctly remembered bouncing around the couch, pretending to be Moses in his pre-Exodus Egyptian attire, of course. Could it be that, in that moment outside the Toronto movie theater, that I was make-believing? After this realization, I'm slowly coming to appreciate the absolutely earth-shattering implications of Schaefer's impossible dream, which calls not just for a new art form, but a complete cultural shift and a re-engagement with both faith and theater. If only for a moment I had experienced firsthand the kind of transformation the Hierophant describes at the end of Ra, it wasn't in the sticky-floored cineplex that this took place, the phantasmagoria of a big screen, Dolby speakers, and imitation butter wasn't enough to trigger it. No, what was essential for this make-believe transformation was my physical, total sensory participation as I walked the streets of Toronto, or whatever sci-fi metropolis it was in my mind. It was this that brought out the spark of the divine in myself, that tiny moment of faith when I could believe myself a hero. Schaefer explains that this is the same mindset that he required of his raw performers that they sincerely trusted that their ritual actions over the course of the eleven hours would permit the sun to rise in the east at daybreak. This is not an easy attitude to acquire, 
he writes, but it can be acquired by degrees as one releases oneself from the fatalism of scientific thinking towards the older philosophy when humans actually believed they possessed powers to affect the external world. I don't want to sound like a cult recruiter, or worse, like a motivational speaker, but I believe Schaeffer's theater of confluence and the ideas behind it could be powerful tools for reinvigorating not only art, but also religion, psychology, and society. I'm gaining a deeper respect for Schaeffer's uncompromising demand for wholehearted participation without irony, a genuine willingness to make believe. His genre of operatic ritual theater will no doubt remain an impossible vision in the contemporary West. The closest we'll get are works like The Magic Flute or Achnaten. But perhaps Schaeffer's idealism can help us reframe the way we view art and religion, and what we get out of aesthetic and or spiritual experiences. For example, I wonder if those of us who are our religious adherents could strengthen and renew our faith if we conducted ourselves in the world as children of God. What would happen if we transcended our tendency to use this phrase as a mere metaphor, no longer acting as if we were divine beings, but acting as the divine beings we firmly believe ourselves to be? Even for those who aren't religious, Schaefer makes a strong case for mythologizing and fantasizing ourselves, a case for looking for inspiration from the heroes of old. He writes, Believing they were descended from the gods, not ascended from the apes, ancient heroes set themselves elevated tasks and aspired to extraordinary goals. Such faith kept the back straight and the eye firm throughout life's adventures and adversities. I don't think Schaefer is necessarily being anti-scientific here. Rather, he's arguing that make-believe can be a force for good in our lives when the rational fails. It's ultimately the role of the artist, in the position of a kind of shamanic bard, to reinvigorate this heroism within the public. The artist is not a social worker, observes Schaefer, but can serve a valuable function if art is allowed to inspire even a few people to raise themselves up and move forward with dignity, confidence, or a newfound sense of purpose.